How is it possible that a reaction that takes one millisecond to occur to have been studied since the 1800s? Oh, it's possible. And that reaction is called action potential. Your body has a ton of nerves, approximately seven trillion of them. And their main job is to send nerve impulses called action potentials to different parts of your body. If you watched my nervous system lecture, we learned that the direction of a nerve impulse is dendrite cell body axon synapse repeat. Dendrite cell body axon synapse repeat. Dendrites receive signals from other neurons. The axon transmits the signal. The axon terminals transmit signals across the synapse to dendrites of a different neuron. And the myelin sheath is what speeds up the signal transmission across the axon. It's these features that allow the neuron to send information down the axon and away from the cell body. This is what we call action potential. If only it were that easy to explain. Let's get started. Body fluid that is not contained in your cells is called extracellular fluid. That makes sense because the prefix extra means outside and this fluid is found outside of your cells. Neurons and neuroglia are embedded in the extracellular fluid, also known as ECF. ECF is mostly made up of water with dissolved salts and other charged ions, such as sodium, potassium, and chloride. The intracellular fluid found inside of the neuron has these charged ions as well. As these ions move in and out of the neuron, the change in ion concentrations, known as the concentration gradient, influences the voltage of the nerve's cell membrane. Most of the time, neurons have a negative concentration gradient. That means that there are more positively charged ions on the outside of the neuron in the extracellular fluid than on the inside of the neuron. Under these conditions, the neuron is considered to be at rest and polarized. Ions are constantly flowing in and out of the neuron, so the neuron has the difficult job of maintaining the negative concentration gradient. A neuron's negative concentration gradient is called resting membrane potential. A neuron's resting membrane potential, also known as RMP, is approximately negative 70 millivolts. Like I said before, ions are constantly moving in and out of the neuron. But what if I told you that there are potassium ions leaking out of the neuron and sodium ions that are leaking in to the neuron. How will the neuron maintain a negative concentration gradient where the outside of the neuron is more positive than the inside if ions are leaking in and out of the neuron? Introducing the sodium potassium pump. This pump moves three sodium ions out of the neuron and two potassium ions in to the neuron. Let's imagine that the neuron is hosting a membrane potential party in your body. Notice that there are potassium and sodium ions on the inside and outside of the membrane potential party. Ooh, Kimberly, I love your outfit. Thanks, Kathy. I got it from Banana Republic. Nate. I am so ready to get up into this party. Me too. Hey, you know what? When this party is over, we should go to Saltgrass Steakhouse. Let's check out the numbers. Right now, there are eight potassium ions, three sodium ions, and one chloride ion in the party. And there are nine sodium, two potassium, and two chloride ions outside of the party. Things look pretty equal to me. So the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. But as the night goes on, potassium starts to leave. Okay, I'm gonna head out. And more sodium starts to enter. Nathan, you're not gonna go home? Nah, I'm going in. As the ions are flowing in and out of the neuron, from a high concentration to a low concentration, 
Not only is it getting harder to equalize the concentrations, but the negative concentration gradient isn't being maintained. What are we going to do? Don't worry, the sodium potassium bouncer is here. Look, this party's getting a bit too full. Sodium, I need three of you to head out. Potassium, two of you can head in. So as you can see, the sodium potassium pump stabilizes the membrane potential party by transporting three sodium out for every two potassium brought in. Since the pump is moving sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient, or in other words, from low concentration to high concentration, this is an example of active transport. While the bouncer is working, let's check out some other parts of the neuron's cell membrane. Over here, notice there are gated channels or three side doors to enter or leave the party. The first door is called the stimulus-gated sodium channel, door number two is called the voltage-gated sodium channel, and the last door is called the voltage-gated potassium channel. As you can see, the bouncer has done a great job of stabilizing the membrane potential, so these doors are closed. Remember, during rest, the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts and all gated channels are closed. But what if something happens at the party that causes a temporary shift in the membrane potential and the inside of the neuron becomes more positive than the outside? Well, my friends, this is the beginning of an action potential. Let's take a look outside of the body. Right now, it's 75 degrees. You're feeling pretty comfortable. All of a sudden, there's an extremely strong gust of wind that changes the temperature by 20 degrees. Do you think your body would be affected if the temperature dropped from 75 degrees to 55 degrees? Uh, definitely. Do you think the resting memory potential of the neuron would be affected? Most definitely. Any stimulus like temperature, pain, or pressure can affect the neuron's membrane potential. Let's see how this drastic change in temperature affects the neuron's membrane potential party. What was that? Remember, at rest, these three doors were closed. But notice the change in temperature opened the stimulus-gated sodium channel. The two voltage-gated doors remain closed because they open and close when there is a change in voltage across the neuron's cell membrane. Man, when are we gonna get up into this party? Hey, Nathan, check it out. That side door is open, for real? Hey, sodium, let's go in. Man, what's going on? No matter how fast the bouncer works, the increased number of sodium entering the party is now beginning to change the voltage of the neuron. Let's take a look at the action potential chart. Notice that we are looking at the membrane potential over time. Remember, before the stimulus occurred, the neuron had a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. Once the temperature dropped, the stimulus caused the stimulus-gated sodium channel to open. The increased number of sodium entering the party is causing the neuron to depolarize. That means the inside of the neuron is becoming more positive. <coughs> if depolarization continues and it reaches negative 55 millivolts, which is called the threshold, the voltage-gated sodium channels open, allowing even more sodium to rush in. Yeah! Ah! Like I said before, the voltage-gated channels will open or close based on the voltage across the neuron cell membrane. So, the threshold of negative 55 millivolts activates the voltage-gated sodium channel. You should also know that at threshold, the voltage-gated potassium channel was triggered as well. But since potassium channels open and close slowly, 
Only a few potassium left the party. We will see these doors fly open in a little bit. Now that the voltage sodium gate is now open, rapid depolarization occurs and the membrane potential has changed from negative 70 millivolts to a positive value. Believe it or not, the voltage gated sodium channels only stay open for about one millisecond and then they close. This allows the voltage to reach a peak of positive 30 millivolts. Remember, voltage gated channels open and close based on different voltages. So at the peak of positive 30 millivolts, the voltage gated sodium channel closes. But at positive 30 millivolts, this causes the voltage gated potassium channels to fly open. Now that the potassium channels are fully open, potassium rushes out of the cell repolarizing the cell. That means that the inside of the neuron is becoming more negative again. Earlier I mentioned that potassium channels are slower to respond, and this is the case again. The potassium channel doesn't close quickly enough, causing too much potassium to exit the cell, and this causes hyperpolarization. That means that the membrane potential of the cell is more negative than it typically is. Notice the dip on the action potential chart. And this happens in one millisecond, so it's extremely quick. You should know that everything shown on the action potential chart is happening in one spot on the neuron. So how does the nerve impulse move from the cell body to the axon terminals? Let's put all the puzzle pieces together. At rest, the resting membrane potential of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts. In order to maintain this negative concentration gradient, where the outside of the neuron is more positive than the inside, the sodium potassium bouncer is moving three sodium out for every two potassium brought in. In response to a signal or stimulus, like the temperature dropping, the soma or cell body end of the axon becomes depolarized. That means sodium ions flow into the cell body. As the voltage increases, voltage gated sodium channels at the part of the axon closest to the cell body activate and more sodium rushes into the negatively charged axon and depolarizes the surrounding axon. Once one channel opens and lets positive ions in, the other channels down the axon do the same thing. When the voltage reaches a peak of positive 30 millivolts, the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open. This causes the first part of the membrane to repolarize and it cannot depolarize again. That means potassium ions flow out of the axon until it returns to its resting state. This is called the refractory period. This means the nerve impulse can only move in one direction down the axon. Notice that the movement of charges in each segment of the axon causes depolarization, which triggers depolarization in another segment of the axon which triggers depolarization in another segment, and so on. So what happens when the action potential reaches the axon terminals? At the end of each axon terminal is a synaptic knob. Notice that the synaptic knob of this neuron forms a synapse with the dendrites of this neuron. This neuron would be considered the presynaptic neuron, and this neuron would be considered the postsynaptic neuron. When the action potential reaches the synaptic knob, voltage-gated calcium channels open, allowing calcium to rush in. The influx of calcium causes the neurotransmitter vesicles to move to the plasma membrane of the synaptic knob and release their contents into the synaptic cleft. This is the physical space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. Once the neurotransmitter is in the synaptic cleft, neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, and one of two things can happen, an excitatory postsynaptic potential or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Wow, 
We covered a lot. Let's take a look at a few questions to see what you remember. Which part of the chart corresponds to the following? Hyperpolarization, depolarization, rest, peak or initiation of repolarization, and repolarization. If you said number one is rest, number two is depolarization, three is peak or initiation of repolarization, four, repolarization, and five, hyperpolarization, you are correct. At rest, the neuron has a resting membrane potential of, and there are more ions outside the neuron and more inside the neuron. If you said A, you are correct. Last question. The sodium potassium pump is an example of transport and moves three ions out of the nerve cell and brings two ions into the nerve cell. If you said B, you are correct. I hope that helped and I'll see you soon. Science G signing out.